The head of HBO came in and whispered in my ear, there's nobody that I'd rather bet my $5 million wow. on. The difference between making it and not making it is razor thin. It's all mental. The consequences are gigantic. GM calls me and says, okay, buddy, this is it. You have to direct it. And if you f it up, you're out. Have a seat out there and have some bread. In today's episode, we're honored to welcome the legendary Marty Kellner. Marty is an Emmy-nominated director and the creator of HBO's Hard Knocks. He's a legend and a transformative figure in modern entertainment. Name a star across comedy or music, and I promise you, Marty has worked with them. Maybe you've heard of some of them. Robin Williams, Chris Rock, Will Ferrell, Billy Crystal, Jerry Seinfeld, George Carlin, Dane Cook, Whitney Cummings, Stevie Nicks, Hart, Kiss, Poison, Rat, The Cranberries, Scorpions, White Snake, ZZ Top, Bette Midler, Pat Benatar, Diana Ross, Justin Timberlake, Fleetwood Mac, Garth Brooks, Gladys Knight, Gloria Estefan, Mark Anthony, to name a few. Today we peel back the layers of Marty's illustrious career, exploring his unique perspective on storytelling, his innovative approaches to directing, and the moments that have defined his journey in the entertainment world. We'll discover what drives his creative genius, how to remain relevant in an ever-changing industry, and the stories behind the scenes with some of the biggest names in music and comedy. Storytellers listen in close because Marty shares some real gems about life, success, and the choices we make that can forever change our lives in an instant. Now let's welcome Marty to the studio. This episode was brought to you in partnership with Little Black Tux. Little Black Tux is my go-to when I need a timeless look. Whether I'm speaking on a film panel, walking a red carpet, or need a bold, sophisticated look for a photo shoot, Little Black Tux has me covered. Little Black Tux isn't just a clothing company, they're a company with a story, a strong why. And you know I love a good story. They're breaking boundaries and creating clothing that empowers women with versatile, upscale options. I love my Little Black Tux, and I know you will too. Thank you for being with us, Marty. I'm a huge fan of yours. And we met under interesting circumstances, and I was absolutely flattered when you asked me to do this. You, like me, spent time growing up in Cincinnati, a town that, that I know can be, um, it's, got, it's got a very small town vibe, even though it's a bigger city in terms of the thoughts, the thought mechanics in the space. It also can be really dreary for days on end. It can rain and rain and rain. Um, and you know, food and, and the arts are kind of the only really great things to do. And I know for me, it really spurned my imagination. How did spending time as a child there really shape the way that you viewed the world? Well, I like being from there. I think growing up in the Midwest gives you certain work ethic and certain values that last your whole career. I don't think that the uh, tastemakers are in New York and LA. I think they're in the Midwest. I agree. And it shaped me because I was a latchkey kid. Mm -hmm. My father left when I was two. And I never saw him again. I don't have anything against him because he gave me life. And my mother used to teach me, you know, proverbs and cliches, which I said, don't tell me this stuff every night, turned out to be the foundations for my life. And she taught me, she said, a man who doesn't build castles in the air doesn't build them anywhere. She was big on dreaming big, right? I've, yes. I've heard you say that before. And she taught me to dream big. You know, I, I have always believed if you can dream it, you can achieve it. When my father passed, he was very, very wealthy. We were very, very lower middle class. And I think our first house cost like $34,000 and she had a big borrow and steal. To you get you talk job. a lot of, about that, about the contrast between your father being oh, so you wealthy enough that, that buildings were named after him and his, your, your mother growing up in Cincinnati, Correct. being from a more right. middle class, lower middle class family right. where you had forks and spoons that didn't match, the contrast between those two environments. How well, do you think that That's where I got my eye. Your world okay? perspective. Because on my house in Cincinnati, there were pictures on the wall of like ships from Kmart that cost like three mm, bucks. Yeah. And, you know, it was, you know, tough. You know, my mother would actually 
steal the sweet and low packs from the uh, restaurants. None of the sub war matched. And when my father died, the family said, oh my God, he's got this son. We got to culture him up. So the time between I was 10 and 18, I spent every summer in Chicago. And I would go from what I knew, which I appreciated, so all of a sudden I'd be in the penthouse of the Drake Hotel with real Picassos, real Monets, real Chagalls. Wow. And I didn't realize it, but by osmosis, there was a big difference. Mm. So when I first started directing, I was hired because that made things beautiful. I didn't know why, but that's why. You just I absorbed it, I huh? developed an eye. Mm. And every woman star wanted to work with me because I knew how to make them look beautiful. But I didn't know how I knew to do this. It just came naturally. Note to self, and, and work with Marty Kellner. He will make you look beautiful. Uh, <laughs> yes, I will, I will, I know. I got to the point where I would DP my own videos because <clears throat> if I worked the camera, I knew how to make them get, when I got to the editing room, I'd have more choices. Sure. And because I shot it. And so, I just was a natural born storyteller. And I used to tell stories in school to get out of doing shit because I was an artist who didn't realize it. And school for me was boring. So I didn't want to like go do homework and algebra. So I would make up stories to tell the teachers mm. and they thought I was like cute and they bought the stories and that's how it kind of started. Huh. And then when I would do all these comedy specials, I'd always have a story opening on them, mm. okay? And when I did music videos, I was the first director who made them all narratives. My first video was a band called Twisted Sister. Yep. We're not gonna take it, and it's, it's a story. It's iconic It's musical. a story. Okay, it starts out with a story about rebellion, about a father who was um, aggressive about his son playing music mm -hmm. and his son rebels and tosses him out a window, or whatever. And I found that I just did it. And my most successful videos, like with Aerosmith, with Alicia Silverstone and Liv Tyler, were all love stories, okay? So. Notice that I call them musicals because your music videos were the first to really employ story into them. Yes. They were the first. They were. What and, were music videos like before that? Uh, um, they were like performance videos or they avant-garde art videos and mm -hmm. crazy shots. And I did all that, but I still told stories, okay? And it resonated. And every video would like shoot to the top. So I just kept doing it. I kept doing it every single video. Bon Jovi and Aerosmith and Hart. And you know, I just started becoming a storyteller. I really don't know how it happened, mm. to be quite honest. It's just a natural ability. Well, one of the things that you talk about, I want to back up a little bit, that I love so much is when we talk about your journey, you talk about not being so creative in grade school. And I know you had a creative awakening that your mom then pushed you towards interviewing at uh, TV stations to possibly get a job. Yeah, I was a bum. <laughs> I was like drug taking, gambling, womanizing, party animal. <clears throat> she was, excuse me, she was worried. What's her son going to be? She worked for a company called TV Guide. Okay. And so she was familiar with the people at the, at the TV stations. And she introduced me to this guy named Gus Bailey, who liked me and gave me a job as a prop man. Mm. on the Nick Clooney show, yeah. which is George Clooney's father. Yeah, Cincinnatian. So I walked into this station, and the first day there was like all these lights and all this action, and there was a plane crash, and it was like applause signs. And I liked action, and I realized this is what I'm supposed to do yeah. on day one. So they couldn't get me out of there. <laughs> and because... And when you find what you love, you find what you love. And seven weeks later, I was directing. Yes. So it was like I got lucky that I was put into an environment that I belonged in. And I just felt at home. And that first job directing, it happened because um, 
one of the one of the directors who was working on this show, he 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 had a tragic loss. It, yes, his daughter. It, was yes, lost. in this particular station, there was all kinds of things. There were sports. There were specials. There were talk shows. But the most important thing was the news. Mm -hmm. And it was a very tough taskmaster named Al Shottlecotty. And everything on the news was either a picture, videotape, or film, or slide. Mm -hmm. There was no newscaster except going in and out of the commercials. It mm -hmm. was impossible to direct. Impossible. This guy's daughter got killed in an automobile crash. And he ran out of the station. There were seven directors on staff. I was the only one there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the GM calls me. He says, okay, buddy, this is it. That's what he means. He says, you have to direct it. And if you fuck it up, you're out. Yeah. I'm getting through it. And then Al Shottlecott, he had a phone up to the control room in the commercial. He says, you're doing good, kid. Just keep staying with it. <laughs> and I became a star. Yeah. Because of that. And then what happened was I was making like $185 a week. And I wanted to make $10,000 a year. I wanted 200 bucks a week. So I asked for a raise. I walked into his office. He said, you know, you're a good director, but you're a great director, but you, you don't follow my rules. Your hair is too long. You don't keep your suit jacket on all the time. Your tie's uh, disheveled. I know your hair is long and you're slicking it back. He said, so I'm not going to give you the raise. Okay. Yep. Take it or leave it. I said, I leave it. And I quit. And I walked outside, and his waiting room was a magazine called Broadcasting Magazine. And I saw an ad in there for a station in Cleveland, Ohio, that wanted a director to do commercials, and it paid 13500 a year. Wow. So I drove up there, nailed it. Learned how to do commercials, learned all about lighting during those years. And, you know, lighting's next to God. And I was there. See, this is what I, what I love about your essence as a storyteller and your career is that after you had your first taste of it, you have continuously, uh, regardless of money, regardless of can I do it? Can I not do it? Leaned in to something each time, each level of your career that you just felt would bring you joy. Right. And it is... I, I'm like Madonna. I kept reinventing myself. Something so original right. to you. And, and it's I want not you about to, money. I want you to tell people what happened next because, because, A, as a storyteller, I don't want to get too much into the career pieces, but as a storyteller, you went from live sports to HBO and comedy specials. Then from comedy specials, you kind of blended at the same time with music specials. Then went back into live music shows. And I think that when we watch your story billing, storytelling capabilities, you see bits of all that. Uh, would you tell them about you went next to Boston to film? Well, here, I'll tell you how I got there. Okay, tell okay. us how you got there. I had this friend from Cincinnati. All the directors there went on to have big careers. His name was Ron Demarius, and he was working at WBC in Boston. And he called me one day. He says, Marty, the Celtics need a director. There's an opening. I told them about you. Why don't you come and meet them? I got in my car. I put the pedal to the metal. I must have gotten 100 miles an hour. I got there, and there was this guy, Paul Koss, who liked me. And then he said to me, I said, well, I, I love sports. I'm a sports guy. I'm a baseball player. I said, I'm not sure I can direct him. He looked me in the eye and he said, you can direct anything. Wow. So I became the guy who directed the Celtics and got a huge name because I would tell stories. I would, before games, I would do cold openings. I would go in the locker rooms. This is before anybody did yeah. this. And my announcer was this guy named Dick Stockton. And we started to get a lot of press. He was freelancing for this company called HBO. And they called me and they said, will you do something for us? And I said, yeah, what's that? He said, we need somebody to produce Wimbledon. I said, Wimbledon the tennis? He said, yeah. I said, damn right, I'll do it. So I did that for three years. And then what happened was I had two job offers. Yep. 
You know the story. I know the story, but I think you should tell everyone. Okay, I had one in NBC Sports to be the guy. Yep. Okay, to be the guy that would do the Super Bowl, Kentucky Derby, NBA Championship, uh, whatever they had, they wanted me to be the guy. And what was the other one, Marty? The other one was this little teeny company that for a third of the money was seven people who said, if you come to us, you can not only do our sports, you can do our specials, which mm -hmm. haven't been invented yet, and you can be responsible for the feel and the ethos of the network. And I said, okay, I'll take that. It was a third of the money. And the first thing I did was an evening with Robert Klein. I had no idea what I was doing. Yep. And, uh, when I and it wasn't perfect because I just was going by my gut. And I turned it in to my boss. And he said, this is terrible. You're fired. I said, no, it's got magic. The head of HBO of Time Life said, this is in our program guide. We're going to air it. I don't think it's so bad. I said, I think it's pretty great. And the New York Times wrote, on January 31st, I was in my hotel room. I called my ex-wife and I said, you think I can get my job back in Boston because I'm fired. The next day, the New York Times wrote four columns on it. And they said, I don't know where HBO got Marty Kallner, but they better bottle him up and sign him up forever. <laughs> so the next day, I was signed to a contract for 10 times the money I was making and giving a series called On Location, where the first one was George Carlin, et cetera, et cetera, At et cetera. HBO, that small At little HBO. station and within I had HBO. Some stuff I put in that to this day they honor was, look, if we're going to hire a creative person, we got to let them do, do their, their job. Yeah. And if we don't like it, we just won't hire them again. Mm. So at least give them the chance to fail on their own sword, not because of some bureaucrat that's sitting in an office that feels that they need to justify their existence. I want to talk a little bit more about that, but first, I just want to, I want to hone in a little bit on this air of confidence because it was really your belief in your work that is part of that magic. It shows up on the screen, but it also showed up in your ability to continue to transform, reinvent yourself and move from one thing to the next. And even from the early age, you talk about how you just knew that you had it. Where do you think in your foundation that came from? Fear of failure. Mm. Okay, I live in a town where you're only as good as your last project. Yeah. So I never tried to have an ego. Mm. And uh, you know, I was, I made it conscious not to become famous, even though I did, I tried not to because I wanted to be with my family every night because I didn't have one. Mm -hmm. So instead of going out with Madonna or Justin Timberlake or Jerry Seinfeld for dinner and having the paparazzi take mm -hmm. me, I went home for dinner. Mm -hmm. And I thought someday I'll be honored for a body of work, and that's exactly what happened. Mm. My air of confidence it was I believed, and I still believe, that it doesn't leave my hands until I'm happy with it. I edit everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have an editor, but I edit everything. And if I'm happy with it, the audience is going to be happy with it. Mm -hmm. I don't do it for anybody but myself. Mm, that's okay? so beautiful. And I have to please me. And there were a couple of times where I didn't please me, and it bombed. But every time that I, and I, I was fastidious about this, yeah. and I made a lot of enemies, but everything went to number I one. I think it's so interesting how in life when we end up following our passion and our art, we end up with greater success. And when we try to chase whatever career norms are, how right. it doesn't always work right. out. And I think your your career and your storytelling story, part, pun not intended, is a, a testament to that. You just kept leaning in to what you knew your art was and the world opened its arms. Yeah, it happened in spite of me pissing off every every uh, beer in spite in the of world. pissing off everyone. And then the, the, how I got in the music videos was now I'm at HBO, I'm in a seven figure of your job. I own it. And but I was getting a little bored. You know, I had done like big specials and all the big comedy acts and you know, and then I was laying in bed in my house in Beverly Hills. I called my boss, a guy named Michael Fuchs at HBO and I said what about HBO West? He said, go for it. 
So I opened up HBO West. No way. Yeah. And That's so I cool. I moved out here, and I was getting divorced, and I was raising my two children. And we got a house on San Ysidro, and that's how I moved to California. Okay, so you have been working across these three different formats. Can you talk a little to how those early experiences doing the comedy specials and then the music videos has shaped the way that you approach even your story storytelling now on Hard Knocks? How is it, how does, how does I guess, being exposed to those different formats in, inform the way that you, you as a storyteller think? Did you feel the evolution as you were going through? Um, I felt it. I don't really know the answer. Okay. Okay. I didn't think about it. It's just what came naturally. That's a perfect answer. I was in bed one day in, in L.A. and I was making all this money on HBO and there was this cable company called the Z Channel. Mm -hmm. And they played this music video. It was uh, Betty Davis Eyes, Kim Carnes, directed by an Australian named Russell Mulcahy. Yeah. And I saw it. My eyes got like big as dollars, silver dollars. And I like said, oh my God, look at this. It's breaking every rule. It's crossing the line. It's jump cutting. It's, it's so artistic and different. And I said to my wife, who I've been married to a long time, who I love dearly, I said, Eliza, I have to go do this. Yeah. That means I have to quit my job. That means we could lose the house. We could be broke. We could live in a car. I don't know what's going to happen. And she said to me, go for it. I love that. All right. Which is, I, you may have heard that before. But she and said, I know that feeling, by the way. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Gives you, you know, they say behind every man's a woman. Well, it's true. And she said, go for it. And she gave me like permission to gamble our future. Mm. I went to New York and met a guy named Ahmed Erdogan who had signed the Stones and signed the Who and signed Led Zeppelin, et cetera, et cetera. And I said to him, I want to do a music video. He says, what's that? <laughs> and I explained. He said, okay, I got three bands. Pick one. He said, I got a band named In Excess from Australia, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. I have a band called Zebra from New Orleans, and I got this bar band. I don't know what the hell to do with. He said, they're called Twisted Sister, and, you know, they're funny, and, you know, they're raucous. And I figure my, my comedy and music background would make a perfect hybrid. Yeah. So I wrote this story and did this video. That We're not going to take too. it. And for the next 12 years, my phone never stopped ringing. I love No that. agent, no manager, no anything. I love and that. And then I got back into HBO because one day, my boss, Michael Fuchs, called me up and he says, I've got a problem with an artist. And I said, I need an adult to go down there and fix it. Who was the artist? Madonna. <laughs> and at this time, Madonna was Madonna. This is the girly show yeah. in Australia. Yeah. So to make a story short, I went and I fixed it and, you know, I did it and blah, blah, blah. And then I just started doing shows for HBO again, one after another, from Garth Brooks in Central Park to Bette Midler to All Justin icons. Timberlake to NSYNC to Britney Spears. And, and they were some of the most tremendous shows. Can you, can you help us and walk us through, like if you're approaching a comedy special or music, can you walk us through your process of how you're breaking it down? Okay, let's say a music video. Yeah. First, I'm sent a song from the record company. Are you interested in this song? Yes. Yes, I'm interested. And then I have a blank piece of paper. All right? Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to be creative with this. Because I'm sitting with a blank piece of paper, and, you know, what am I going to do? So I start brainstorming with my people that work for me, you know, what are we, how are we going to do this? And eventually, after about a week, we start to come up with some idea and then develop the idea, develop the idea, develop the idea, and then budget what it would cost, and then go try and tell the record company this is what we wanted to do. And I would hire storyboard artists to do money boards that were so spectacular that they couldn't say no. Yeah. And it would come to the point where, like, my favorite video is this video called Living on the Edge with Aerosmith. Okay. There's so much stuff jammed in there 
And when I took it to the record company, he said, this is great. What's it going to cost? He said, a million three. He said, are you out of your mind? A <laughs> for a music three? video, that's an insane uh, budget. Well, yeah, back then. Back were, then, for sure. There were, there were some. Yeah. yeah. And he out of your mind. I said, okay. I said, uh, here's everything. You and the band decide what, what you don't want. I think and I, I was know. banking on them being creatively greedy. <laughs> well, we got to have him. Gail was getting hit by a train. Well, that's 300000 We all We got to have him stealing the car. We got to have this. We got to have that. We got to have great. this. By the time we ran, they wanted everything. So that's they, great. So they bitched, but they paid. And then they all made a fortune. When I first met Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, they had just finished a video called uh, Walk This Way with Run DMC. Mm. They were living in $200 a month apartments, had $200 a week allowances, and I called up their A&R guy named uh, John Kalodner, who I had just done White Snake for. That's a whole other story. And I said, I want to work with these guys. He said, well, they're signed for three videos with this guy, John Small. I said, okay, and next day, they were at my house, all right, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry. And what Steven Tyler got on his knee and said, I want a house like this. <laughs> I said, by the time I'm done with you, you'll have 10 houses like wow. this. And that's what happened. And we did Do Looks Like a Lady. And from that angel, it went on and on and on and on and on. And, you know, they all now have 10 houses and, you know, they're multi, multi-millionaires. And, uh, I brought them back. I just want to talk a little bit. You talked about that, that feeling of, I have to do this, I have to do this. And you've also talked a lot of, about um, not focusing on results. For me, when I have that feeling, I see something and I'm inspired and like, I have to do this. It's a mixed feeling of absolute excitement and dread. Correct. Like I'm half depressed and I'm half excited because I know I have to do it. And at the same time, I'm kind of like, I think part of me is a little disappointed that I haven't yet. And, and then there's like the excitement around it. Um, when you talk about not focusing on results and you You'll talk like about this. having those feelings, okay. what, what is that about? All right, for me, it's all about the work, mm -hmm. okay? The results will take care of themselves, okay? If you're happy with the work, you can't do anything about the audience going to like it or not like it. And if you try to figure it out, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. So my focus was always about the work and putting my head down one foot at a time and just concentrating on having all great moments. Mm. And if you look at my videos to this day, there's not a bad frame in any of them because the way people watched music videos were they wouldn't like sit down and stare at them. They'd be having a conversation and they'd look over and they'd see a little piece and they'd see a little piece, but because they aired so many times, eventually they would take the whole thing in. Yeah. So, I just didn't want to hate anything. And if I liked everything, they liked everything. And if I focused on the results, you can't. You got to focus on doing the work. I imagine, and I know personally as a creative, that that also can become crippling, right? You have to kind of, at some point, start to your point, creating for yourself and just being proud of the moments you put out, not wondering about. I'm always the scared. Rest. Yeah. Every time. I'm always scared too. Always, you always. know. You know, it's a lot of money. Yeah. It's a big responsibility. And fear of failure is a real motivator. Mm -hmm. And I'm nervous before I do any project. I remember when I was doing Garth Live in Central Park, I had my whole control room with candles and incense. And I'm <laughs> rocking like this. And I'm really nervous because this is the biggest show HBO ever did. And there's 30 cameras. And anything can go wrong because it's live and doing lives like walking, sitting on a razor blade. So I do music videos with like one camera, like doing a film. But when you're doing a live show, yeah. different ball game, yeah. different type of preparation. Yeah. And finally, I, I, you know, I was hoping that something would happen. And uh, I was hoping the Iraq war was about to start. I said, start the war right now so that they'll take us off the air. And the, the head of HBO came in and whispered in my ear. He said, there's nobody that I'd rather bet my $5 million wow. on. And then the other part of this story is that I had this limo driver, this Israeli limo driver, this old beat-up limo, who would drive us to the set every day and would hear my conversations. So one day, right before the show, my son walked in with a note from the limo driver, and he said, don't worry, Marty. 
God is watching you from a distance. Wow. Well, I had just finished Bette Midler, and one of her songs was From a Distance. Wow. And that relaxed me, and that relaxed me. And the next day, the New York Daily News had a headline and said, thanks to the blessed direction by Marty Collner. Absolutely true story. Oh, my goodness. I know. It's otherworldly, but it's an absolutely no, true story. No, but you're speaking story. my language. I yeah, love that. Yeah, so it was blessed. It was serendipitous. It was bigger than me. I do believe that certain projects are bigger than you, and things happen mm. good despite, your, despite yeah. you. And that's the best feeling in the world. I'm going to have Charlie uh, pull up your song, and I'm going to get to the rapid fire, but I'd be remiss to not really quickly at least touch upon hard knocks because okay. um, you redefine the way that we tell story about sports and I know that there was a lot of resistance sometimes yeah, to but hard knocks. There's, there's good stories about hard knocks. Yeah, I would love to I would love to know taking these other two formats then you started in the world of sports, you go through these two other formats and then you go back to the world of sports. How did it change? The because way hard knocks is sports. not about sports. Say again. It's not about sports. Hard knocks is not about no, sports. I'm not, okay. You want to sit down and then I'll come back to that? I'll tell you. Please. One day I was sitting in my kitchen and I closed my eyes. And about 30 seconds I came up and I told my family, I got a great idea. I want to do training camp. What hard knocks is about are the cuts. Mm. Okay. That's what hard knocks is, is when someone knocks on your door and says, coach wants to see you, bring your playbook. Now, here's the story. These guys were all superstars in junior high school, high school, and college. And now they're on the pro stage where everybody is as fast and as big as they are. Yeah. The difference between making it and not making it is razor thin. It's all mental. The consequences are gigantic. Mm. You go from being the worst looking guy to the best looking guy and going from having everything you want to handling bags at the airport. It's razor thin. And, and these guys have, this is what all the stories are about. These guys have, have uh, uh, families that have been supporting them through all their journey and they want to pay them back and buy them houses. They got and, bigger reasons, bigger purposes. Yeah, that was so. That's the story. Mm. Is he going to make it? Is he not going to make it? You have seventy-five guys uh, uh, fighting for fifty-two jobs in six weeks. That's why I've been approached to do it for for other sports. Of course, we want hard knocks in baseball. We want hard knocks. In, doesn't work because there's no story there. It's mm. just a documentary. These are about individual stories about how these guys progressed and what they're going through in order to survive. Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not a tremendous sports fan, but I watch your show because it really shows the humanity and what each of these individuals are going through. And well, the narrator, the storyteller is Liv Schreiber. Liv Schreiber. And the only time I get upset when there's not enough Liv Schreiber, because uh -huh. he's, the, he's the show. Yes. He's telling the story, okay? And that's why it works. Okay, we are going to get into our rapid, our rapid fire piece. So I, I do this rapid fire-ish section because when we develop worlds, when we develop characters, you and I, it's really about understanding the perspective that laid the foundation. We go through these exercises with characters. And so this is a little bit about your character as a storyteller. I asked you what your favorite song was, and you had said Circles by Post Malone was one of several. Marty, what does that song mean to you? What do you think of? What I think does... life is a circle. Mm. And I think that, you know, creativity is a circle. And I thought it was beautifully presented. And I loved the music. And it made me, made me bop. Yeah. And it was, it just fed a lot of things for me, you know. It, uh, you know, I, I can't really put my finger on why I like it, answer. but it just, you know. That's a perfect answer. And I asked you what your favorite drink was, and the first answer was Diet Coke. Diet Coke. What does Diet Coke remind you of? Well, I don't eat sugar, so it's sweet, and I don't drink, so it's non-alcoholic. I don't do drugs. I'm a vegan. 
<laughs> this is a complete, and I could tell you stories about all that all happened because it's very interesting. But we, we might don't have, have to time. have you back on. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, so this is a kind of like a good tasting. That's a great answer. Yeah, That's it's a not great very answer. good for you, but when I leave here on the way home, I'll drink a bottle of water. <laughs> um, when I say the word home, what do you think of? Security. Mm. Love, mm. happiness, purpose. What about the word heaven? Heaven. Yeah, heaven. That's the right word. What about, no, what about, the, what, so you think of home when you say the word heaven? I think home is heaven. Oh. Yeah. What about the word hell? Hell's everything else. Mm. I think show business is hell. <laughs> what about your favorite food. Which one do you find most comforting? I like sushi. Sushi. I love that. I had lunch, sushi lunch when I, before I came over here today. Oh, it sounds so I became right a now. pescatarian. I was pure vegan, but I was doing a Mark Anthony special, and my doctor said, you've got to get some protein, start eating fish. <laughs> so we were in the Bahamas, and all there was was fish. So, yeah, I love sushi. What sound makes you smile? Your voice. Oh, thank you. Um, the sound of music makes me smile. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah, music's my first love. How do you define love? That's an interesting question. It's supposed to be. Well, love's about respect, mm -hmm. in my opinion. You have to respect your partner. They have to respect you and acceptance, okay? What happens is you learn to accept other people's faults when you're in love. And I always tell my children, I said, listen, perfect marriages do not exist. Okay, they don't exist. I said, but hold an imaginary scale in front of you, put on what you like on one side and what you don't like on the other and see what weighs more. Hmm. Okay, because men and women are different, but they're all the same and you know, Love is about acceptance, it really is, and about support. I mean, it's, 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 it's complicated, but, you know, I, I, I totally love my wife. Yeah. Does she have stuff I hate? Of course. Do I, do I do stuff she hates? Oh, yeah. But the core and the, and the respect and the loyalty yes. is there. Nobody cheats. Nobody does anything like that. We're in it for the long haul. So, how about, and love is friendship. How about success? How do you define success? One moment at a time. Mm, see, this is why okay. we're friends. Yeah. What about failure? The worst. The worst feeling of all time. It's, uh, you, but you learn from failure, mm -hmm. okay, which is good. Because you, I always say you can make a mistake once, just don't make the same mistake twice. Sure. And so failure I look at as a learning experience, even though it gives me a chakra problem in my, my gut. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I try not to fail, but I'm not perfect. Do I'm you a human being. Do you believe in magic? A hundred thousand fucking too. percent. That, to me, is the most important thing that I bring to my projects. Yeah. I always make them magical. Yes, you do. Oh, my God. Oh, what yeah. about second chances? I'm down for that. I'm down for second chances. I've had enough. Uh, love at first sight. I've had it, even though not in the physical sense. Uh, there's this actress I work with, Alicia Silverstone. I met her when she was 16. Yeah. She walked into my office to read for a part in a music video. Uh, called Crime, which won Video of the Year. Yep. And I knew that I was going to know her the rest of my life. Oh, that's I so beautiful. I fell in beautiful. love with her at first sight. That is so beautiful. And I'm still talking to her. I talked to her last night. I'm going to an event at her house. She's become my family. My whole family loves her. It was love at first sight. I believe in love at first sight. Without considering time, ability, or money as an obstacle, what's one thing you've always wanted to do or learn? I'm about to do it. I want to do a feature. Yes. Okay. And I know I'll be successful and entertain I do people. But I wanted, I've turned down many films because when I would say, 
yeah, I need, but I need Final Cut, they'd throw me out. I'd say, you don't get Final Cut. You know, Cher once asked me, how come you don't do films? You can't afford it. And I said, that's one reason. But the other reason is, you know, give me Final Cut. I'll take anything. I love that. And last but not least, off the top of your head, what's your favorite story? Uh, my favorite story I ever told, I think, was uh, Living on the Edge. Living you on know, the Edge? It was about how life and people are just walking that razor blade. It's an epic, epic music right. video and one of my favorite. I can also sing all the words for you on the next sure. episode. No <laughs> Marty Callenert, thank you so much for joining us at Storyteller no Studio. Sure. We are, we are so happy to have you, and we hope you come back on so we can keep telling yeah, more stories. Yeah. Not easy to talk about me. <laughs> Next time we'll talk about me a little bit. I'm down. <laughs> I love you. Thank you so much. Come in, come in. Have a seat out there and have some bread.